we need our scientists to be able to either not have their sense of identity at all tied in with their ideas or to have their sense of identity be, if anything, a pride in objectivity, a pride in willingness to be proven wrong and learn new things. And, and I think that when that's compromised in the scientific community, we're all in danger. You must be some kind of therapist. I am some kind of therapist, and I'm about to take you on a journey through the inner wilderness. I've invited brilliant guests from all walks of life to join me as we investigate, illuminate, and inspire transformation in ourselves, intimate relationships, and the social ecosystems we are constellated in. What you are about to hear may surprise you, so hang on to your earbuds for a hefty dose of sanity in a chaotic world. I am Stephanie Wynn, a licensed marriage and family therapist, branching out and building bridges between psychology and everything else under the sun. It's my honor to have you along for the ride. Let's get started. I'm so excited to have Colin Wright as my guest today. He is a jack of many trades, an evolutionary biologist and writer. He recently wrapped up being an editor at Quillette and is now focusing full-time on writing for the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. Is that right, Colin? Yep, that's correct. I, I'm, I'm their senior editor, so I manage their newsletter and their substack and uh, almost, almost all the visual writing content that, that comes out of that. So yeah, that's what, what I'm currently doing. Okay. So your background is in evolutionary biology, and I heard that you specialized in the social behavior of insects and spiders, which is fascinating because I rarely think of those as being social creatures. Um, and you've shared that from studying social behavior, you see some links between what you've learned in biology and the interests that you've been focused on more recently, with ha- which have to do with human social issues. Yeah, I, I said the reason I went into studying social behavior, you know, I wasn't initially just interested in ants, bees, and wasps and all that stuff, or even spiders. Um, but I, it's sort of a, an area where you can test certain scientific questions that you can't ethically test in humans. So I studied animal personalities and then especially group level personalities. So how, you know, no two individual behaves the same way consistently over time. Uh, That's the same as the groups too. And you can actually modify like the composition, the behavioral composition of individuals within groups. And you can look at how that manifests at the group level for certain types of, uh, you know, organizing of different tasks. So that's what I studied, and as I mentioned, off, you know, before we started recording here, is uh, that could not have even prepared me for this sort of social dynamics that I've learned in humans over the past three years. Sort of getting into a lot of different culture war issues and and stepping on a lot of third rails, uh, at least you know, uh, in terms of in, in the sense of a lot of ideas now seem to be sort of taboo, and seeing the response of a lot of my colleagues to that. So it's been an education that the, the kind you don't get in school or you can't really find in the literature that much if you're studying insects. I bet. That's fascinating. And I agree. There's there's our formal education that has a lot of value. And then there's there are the life lessons that come if we're awake and paying attention and, and connecting the dots between our book learning and our experiences. But before we go further, um, so ants, bees, and wasps, I know from my own my own little bit of geekery that those are all hymenoptera and that they all share similar behaviors when it comes to um, mating, reproduction, and social behavior. And um, I know you've discovered a lot that applies to humans that's beyond anything that background could have prepared you for, but what are some of kind of the key fun facts or takeaways about hymenoptera social behavior? You know, there's sort of straddling this line between being an individual and being, you know, we, you have all these individual ants, bees, and wasps, but then at the level of the colony, they can also be considered like this new type of individual. It's often called like a super organism where you can look at sort of the queen as being the real only individual of the group and all of the workers are sort of just like the, the somatic cells of them. They're, they're more specialized doing their different tasks. And that is just such a fascinating thing to study and then especially studying things like how those social systems can be co-opted by you know another species that can you know take on the chemical signals of the queens and manipulate colony level 
personalities and social behaviors. And uh, there's just all kinds of uh, fascinating things. I specifically looked at whether or not I could test the personality of a queen who founds her nest in the beginning of the season all by herself. And then, you know, can I know a bunch of things about how that queen behaves and then predict how her future colony is going to behave just based on knowing the founder's behavior? And it turns out that you can, and you can also predict their uh, the, the way the colony is, well, whether or not it's going to survive or its likelihood of survival as well. So that was, wow. I think, what I would call like my main discovery in my research was predicting an entire group level personality based on just the personality of like a founder individual. So that's, I think that's just fascinating stuff. I know humans subject all kinds of animals to anthropomorphism and, and oftentimes we read personality as more of a projection of ourselves in on animals, but here we take an animal that's not at all cute or warm or fuzzy, that doesn't have a limbic system, something as small as an insect, and you as a biologist can tell us that they actually do have a personality. How much variation in personality or behavior is there from one queen to a next? There's so much. I mean, you wouldn't even know. A lot of people used to look at animals and they would see differences in their behavior, but they, they thought this was all sort of um, I guess, evolutionary noise, that there was maybe some optimal way for an individual to behave that stood true, um, you know, for every individual. But a lot of what people have been discovering, this is over the last 20 years of, of animal behavior research, is that a lot of this variation between individuals is not just noise. Like, there is actual evolutionary advantages. There's, there's, there's evolved variation within groups, um, because sometimes you need to have specialists within a within a social insect colony, for instance, that are going to be optimized at certain tasks uh, instead of others. And there are trade offs where if you learn one task, you know you're not as efficient as another task. So it's this division of labor on the basis of of personality type that is actually showing to be highly adaptive. And almost any social group that we've investigated to look for the presence of is consistent inter-individual differences of behavior or personality, you really tend to find it. It's almost just the weird anomaly to, to find individuals where you see no consistent uh, differences between individuals. And I think, I think that's fascinating. It allows individuals and colonies to sort of partition their individual niches, ever, ever finer detail. You know, if you're all really aggressive, you know, that's not the best tactic. Sometimes maybe it pays to be more of a sit and wait type of individual, uh, even of the same species. So yeah, variation is, is sort of the name of the game. It seems mm -hmm. obvious looking back now because that's all that Darwin was about is, you know, variation and selection. But, you know, there, there was something seemingly counterintuitive of, of that it would be the case within a species and not just sort of between species. So that's, mm -hmm. that's that what got me first, I guess, fascinated with the, the whole animal personalities and group level collective personalities as well. You just put two and two together for me, division of labor and personality. I think in humans, it's easy to imagine that an artist might have a typically a different personality profile from a plumber. Um, and, and yet, I don't often think of division of labor and personality as being that deeply intertwined. But what I hear you describing about insects, it makes sense. I mean, I don't know all the different tasks that ants are responsible for, but I could imagine that if some of them are warriors and some of them are carrying leaves, that, you know, the warrior would have a more aggressive personality and the leaf carrier would be more industrious. I don't know. I mean, yeah. how do you measure personality in insects? What are some personality traits that you could even put on a spectrum? Yeah, so it's a lot harder in animals because unlike people, you can't just give them a, a survey or a, you know, a multiple choice test or some online thing where they, you know, can ask them questions about, you know, do you like social <laughs> interactions? Do you feel exhausted when you're in social <laughs> environments? Uh, you basically have to just observe what they're doing in context that we can, you know, generally assume that are, are consistently ones in which they might be fearful or ones that they're social, uh, interacting socially in. So a lot of my research and a lot of researchers, there's sort of a, a few behavioral uh, personality traits. They'll look at something like boldness, which is the propensity of an individual to engage in risky types of behavior. And you'll test that by doing things like testing for what's called neophobia. You put some really bizarre object they've never seen in their environment, and you look at how long it takes for them to possibly investigate this thing. So really shy individuals are going to be more taken aback and then some bold individuals are 
this is interesting. They'll walk right up to it. And this is, you know, in, in nature, when you're approaching novel things, there's a sort of danger to it because it could be dangerous. With my spiders, what we would do is we would sort of give them this aversive stimulus, which was a, a puff of air that normally is indicative that something is something large is next to them. And so they do this, this death feign where they'll pull in their legs and they'll just sort of remain, remain tucked in. Uh, and some individuals will just go out of that tuck instantly and they'll walk around normally. Some will remain tucked for minutes and minutes and minutes on end. Uh, and the entire, during the entire trial, they've just, they, they're staying huddled in fear. So that's sort of how we measured uh, boldness in our spiders. But you can also look at things like aggressiveness. Um, there's certain levels of, of how gregarious they are. They, they tend to pair with other individuals or they're more aversive to you know, individuals of the same species. Uh, so there's, there's all kinds of things you can do. And usually the test is going to differ based on the species. Uh, and there is sort of this assumption that these are consistent between species, even though it's you can never know from their perspective whether or not an organism believes they're in the same situation as another. So there is there is some subjectiveness to it, but it's at least you can make some some reasonable assumptions about about what they're doing. I I started feeling tickled when you were talking about spiders. I can't remember the word you use, like crunch hunching what was it? Yeah, the word? They, they tuck in there. Tucking their, in. Their I have yeah. I have to tell you this spider story. Um <laughs> so one day I was sitting right here talking to someone just like this. Um, it was one of my clients. So we were doing telehealth therapy. And fortunately, this was somebody who was having a pretty good day. They, they could tolerate an interruption. Um, so I'm sitting there talking to them, right, on my laptop. And a spider appears on my laptop. <laughs> and so I interrupt my client like, wait, hang on, I got a spider on my laptop. Was it like walking across and- the camera and everything it, it was i mean it was starting to come down the screen so i needed to resolve this spider situation right so i i get up to go get the vacuum or something and and when i come back the spider has crawled down the side of my laptop and into my eighth inch audio jack <laughs> <laughs> and all i see are its little paws sticking out yeah. And I just I like go to war with the spider and my my client can hear me shrieking. I'm not great with spiders. Um <laughs> <laughs> I've had to overcome some arachnophobia to live where yeah. I live because I do deal with them here and it's just a fact of life. But <laughs> but the client um, became your therapist to help you deal with the <laughs> I think she was just laughing. <laughs> 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 she enjoyed the story yeah like i said she was having a good day it didn't it wasn't like in the middle of a tragedy but i had to watch spider behavior myself because this spider knew that something was coming for it and it it went hiding in this tiny little hole i mean it was surprising that a spider of this size could fit into an eighth inch audio jack but i i watched it like this and we were just kind of this having this standoff for a little while and then it would <laughs> start to come out a little bit more and then i'd come close and it would pull back in yeah, it you took know, a while. Put like a shadow across the wall. They'll they'll move if a shadow goes over their faces or the air moves around them any any bit. Yeah, they're they're pretty aware, especially for vibrations. So just you're like putting your hands on the counter, they can mm-hmm. feel all that stuff. You'd have to work in really specific sort of tables in the lab that are just like cemented in the ground that are incredibly heavy, just so they don't reverberate. Because some little you know someone putting their hand on the other side of the table can just ruin your entire behavioral assay you're doing on the spiders so wow a lot of stuff you don't even think about just you know my my tapping on the desk or something yeah it's, it's they're really attuned <laughs> to their environment in many ways they're not well some are very really visual most aren't that visual they're just purely vibrational so they can probably yeah. sense your your uh your fear that reminds <laughs> me of another mind. biology thing i want to pick your brain on i don't know if you have any insights about this i know you don't specialize in birds but you know the birds that um, – well, have you seen uh, Connected with Latif Nasser on Netflix? Mm-hmm. Oh, it's a really good show. And um, they – do you know this bird? I'm forgetting the name of the bird. But it has a big migratory pattern from North to South America across the Atlantic. And they found that uh, what time of year the bird migrated, sometime in like early summer uh, – that the variation in the time that it migrated and the length of the nesting season 
correlated with the intensity of the hurricane season in the Atlantic later Mm -hmm. that same year, and that the bird behavior was a better predictor of how the hurricane season was going to be than meteorologists. Do you know that story? I haven't heard that. That's that's really... That's intense. Yeah, that's that's insane. (laughs) I was just wondering, I mean, when you talk about how spiders are sensitive to vibration, of course, that makes sense. When you're that little, you have to have a way of sensing the movements of things around you that could get you. And it made me wonder with this tiny little bird, if, if a bird might have sensitivities in its body to things like atmospheric pressure or humidity or other things that would tune it into those conditions months in advance. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. For sure. I think a lot of them do respond to changes in, you know, air pressure. Uh, Also, you know, birds, a lot of the migratory ones, they have, uh, they're experts in sensing Earth's magnetism. They can tell, you know, just the shifts at all. And they use this for like a lot of their flight patterns and how they go from, you know, when they're migrating, that's how they kind of know they've arrived somewhere. And um, it's the same for, for turtles as well and how they navigate from, you know, to a, a, a some beach that they were born in that they've never seen in their life. They're coming back to some place they left when they were just little turtles. Uh, and, you know, something in their brain sort of solidifies where they were born and they can somehow match these, these patterns up of, you know, the Earth's magnetism to be able to go to the exact same beach that they went to, you know, that's can be a thousand miles away. It's, it's, it's really intense to have how a lot of animals can, can perceive just these, these forces that we, we can't even detect whatsoever. That reminds me of, uh, an insect, the monarch butterflies, you know, their migratory pattern that it's across generations. So I can't remember which direction it's going in. Cause one, one direction that one generation covers the whole migratory path. And then the other direction, I think there's maybe four different stops and four different generations or something like that. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, they fly quite a quite a ways too. You would never even know. They seem to just sort of be fluttering about, but they're like actually narrowing in on some some very specific location in Mexico <laughs> where yeah. they're going to reproduce. Do you know yeah. what's the explanation for how butterflies across generations can remember the locations? You know, I'm not sure specifically with butterflies how they do it. I would imagine similar to birds, probably some sort of earth magnetism detection they can have um but i'm not exactly totally sure with the butterflies but yeah it's nothing ever ceases to amaze me with social behavior and you know what individuals can also do yeah so speaking of to bring it back to to where you were going with that how did you go from studying social behavior in insects to spending most of your time writing about human social issues that's I, st- I keep I still ask myself that <laughs> very very constantly because I never would have guessed that this is what I'd be writing about if you asked me maybe four years ago before I started doing. It. A lot of it was so I guess we have to back up a little bit. Uh, I used to be very active in the the, the new atheist community back in the day, and I was always I, ha- I had a blog where I would debunk pseudoscience. That was kind of what I did. And a lot of the pseudoscience at the time, I was really interested in evolutionary biology. So a lot of the pseudoscience I tried to debunk was uh, sort of a lot of creation myths and um, intelligent design uh, type arguments, you know, saying that evolution can't be naturalistic. It has to have some creator that's helping it over these evolutionary hurdles. Uh, So I got really involved in not just the atheist community, but sort of uh, evolutionary biology and this whole debunking sphere. I was, you know, was, and still I'm a big fan of Michael Shermer, just like the very sort of the skeptic uh, community, if you will. Um, And that's what I was doing before I went to grad school for evolutionary biology. And then when I was in grad school, I I kind of packed up my blog just because I didn't have any time to write about anything else and and read about anything else besides the social behavior of spiders and insects. And so that's what I sort of did for the entire five years I was in grad school. You know, up until maybe the last two years of it, where I started seeing friends on Facebook and other social media. And these are also some of my colleagues that would post really bizarre articles on Facebook. Uh, things like, you know, why there's five sexes or, you know, the, the six sexes. 
And I just thought this was fascinating. Was like maybe they, certainly they're talking about like gender expression or something like that, some sort of cultural anthropological thing. Because some of my friends were cultural anthropologists, so I, that's, I thought that's what they must have meant. But then the papers were going and talking about chromosomes, and you know, the, the, to me, I was just addressing what I uh, what I saw was just pure scientific errors in the way that that these articles were portraying sex. They would, you know, they would look at these different arrangements of sex chromosomes, like someone who is Klinefelter syndrome, I think that's their XXY, might be XYY, I can never remember exactly which one. But they would look at these different variations of sex chromosomes, and they would try to say that each one of those is its own unique sex, you know, apart from male and female. And my initial foray into these debates had nothing to do with, you know, does gender ideology, is it harmful to society? Is it, you know, what are sex-based rights? Is, should trans women compete in sports? That was not even on my mind. It was just like, oh, these are just really, these are just incorrect arguments. And I'm just going to apply my, you know, debunking thing to these, like, oh, there's just a miscommunication here. <laughs> but then when I would respond in the way I always did, which was always very cordial, always just, you know, like, oh, you know, th- I think there's a misinterpretation here. It was never just like, you're wrong, here's why. I was always really careful about how I'd interact with people um, and say things weren't true. And the response that I would get was just, I don't think I could describe it as anything besides venomous. You know, it was it, it calling, bringing in racism into it. I'm a white supremacist or something for saying this. I'm just using white supremacist arguments or I'm inherently transphobic if I'm saying that these aren't different sexes. Even like, what does this have to do with transgenderism? Like, and so... I was about to finish up grad school, and so I sort of pulled back because I was like, I need to apply for jobs pretty soon, and people are calling me horrible things on social media like this. I can't do this. So fast forward here. Over time, I sort of had this sort of existential (laughs) uh, crisis about, you know, why do I even want to be an academic anyway? Because things sort of, the heat was turned up on all these things. Um, And I realized how much I was self-censoring on this topic and it became the, like the only thing I could think about. I could hardly think about my own research anymore because I knew that I could teach someone about the latest findings in social insect collective personalities or something, knowing that half the students in my class might not know what a male and a female is because this is sort of the direction everything was going. And I just I saw my research as being essentially useless and why would anybody care about this when there's so many bigger issues in biology to talk about that people thought I, I spoke about well. And so I just sort of kind of leaned into it. Um, and that's what I've been doing ever since. And I had left academia uh, partly to pursue that also because I think my reputation had been slandered quite a bit while I was there that I didn't feel confident that I could actually get hired on as a faculty member or achieve tenure. So I just kind of wanted to take control over my own my own future and my own career. Uh, and also the whole diversity, equity, inclusion stuff was going on there. And I, I refused to sort of write these boilerplate super, I guess, I mean, I would call them, you know, woke DEI statements that is you need to acknowledge group identity as being the most important thing. You can't oppose, you know, affinity groups, which is what I viewed as like racial segregation in the workplace. Uh, so it's just, it's not a place for me though. All the reasons I wanted to be an academic for free speech reasons and arguing about facts, uh, you know, using facts and not attacking people, those no longer seem to be uh, part of academia. And so I found those conversations to be happening outside of it. So that's what I'm doing now. It sounds like a natural process of sort of taking one step at a time, pursuing your interests, and then discovering along the way where your skills are really needed. and. Also, it's kind of like you're building something and you have a plan for how to build it, but then you encounter an unexpected obstacle and, okay, we have to solve that problem before we can keep building this thing. And in your field, you could focus on the micro level zoomed in to just teaching biology. But when you see that there's this bigger picture issue where there's a a social problem that's undermining your field to potentially make your teachings irrelevant, then, well, that's, we're going to have to stop and deal with that. And there is some connection. I think it's interesting that you were talking about group identity now, and you're also talking about 
group identity when you're talking about insects. So I'm I'm wondering what it was like for you as someone who had studied group identity and group behavior to then be kind of subject to this imposition on what your role as an academic should be as defined by an institution. Yeah, because I kind of felt like an ant that had some weird scent and everyone in academia is just like, is this is this one of us or is this some other colony member all of a sudden? Uh, it was it was a really bizarre experience because I had to experience nothing but sort of a support by people who were other evolutionary biologists. You know, when I would make arguments against creationism or intelligent design, it was, you know, I was never viewed as being very strident when I did that. And I had nothing but institutional support. Nothing I did I would ever dream of that would have I would have ever thought would have be, would hurt me, uh, you know, academically or anything like that. Um, but that has largely to do with sort of the I guess you know I use this phrase off of but the power dynamics that are involved there with the fact that within academia you have so many people that are you know selected from a certain side of the political spectrum, and the people that I was arguing with were mainly conservative Christians, you know, evangelicals who were having these certain ideas about evolution. And so there was just no, there there were no conservative Christians in the in the university, or at least not to any to any large degree, where I would sort of feel like I was alienated or anything like that. But when I started criticizing certain ideas that were coming out of the universities that a lot of my colleagues believed, um, it just became it became a problem. <laughs> you know, they, I no longer had their support. I just sort of became immediately this enemy because they had made this identity around these ideas. And to me, I've always tried to separate ideas from my identity. I don't even, the the word identity is sort of a weird term to me, but I could never think about identifying with conclusions that I come to. Everything is, everything's up for debate, you know, all these different, different ideas. I I saw myself as attacking ideas and they saw these attacks on ideas as, you know, attacking who they were as people. And so, yeah, I just sort of became this, this weird pariah and a lot of people, you know, treated me that way within, within the academy. So uh, it's been interesting to see how these, I guess, I mean, you could, these are group level personality differences that we see. I mean, we know that your political affiliation is uh, largely predicts, or I guess the other way around, your personality largely can predict your person, uh, your, your political orientation. And I just think it would be fascinating to look at a collective personality type analysis of conservatives and, and, you know, uh, progressives or whatever you want to call these two groups and just how, how they operate at the group level. Are there any like actual interesting differences in the way they go about trying to, you know, persecute individuals or, you know, what are they doing? So yeah, it was, it was definitely an education in group level personalities, or at least in this case with humans, sort of uh, ideologies is, is something, I guess, that a lot of anal- other animals don't have that adds another more interesting layer on top of the human condition. When you talk about people in your field starting to base their identity and something very personal on their ideas, I mean, first of all, I find that shocking as an, as an academic in the hard sciences, um, that, that, would, that that would become a norm there. And also, from a psychological perspective, I have to say what a what a just terrible idea that is for anyone's mental health to to base your sense of who you are on an idea because an idea is so fickle. It doesn't matter what the idea is; it's it's fickle, yeah. and it's not a solid foundation for something that you're going to need to rely so heavily on throughout your life as your sense of who you are, um, and your sense of what has the power to be able to disturb you. And if anything, as a scientist, to whatever extent you do base your personality or your sense of self on your profession of being a scientist, part of being a scientist is being dispassionate, is trying to have an objective enough view that you can set aside personal beliefs, set aside hopes or the results you would ideally like to see from your research, that you can set all of that aside enough to look at the data dispassionately And that's how we discover new things. We always need some subset of society to be in that role. There are other people with different personalities, different division of labor, whose role is going to be more emotional. If you're an artist, for example, it's good to be led by your passions because those passions can create works of art that benefit all of us. But we need our scientists 
to be able to either not have their sense of identity at all tied in with their ideas or to have their sense of identity be, if anything, a pride in objectivity, a pride in willingness to be proven wrong and learn new things. And and I think that when that's compromised in the scientific community, we're all in danger. Yeah, there's a tendency, and it's something I used to argue against when I was debating intelligent design people is, you know, people would have an argument about evolution and they would say, well, as a Christian, I believe this about, it's like, well, I don't particularly care about what you believe as uh, anything besides someone who cares about evidence and is willing to follow the evidence to its logical conclusions. I mean, so we, I see the same thing a lot of times, you know, like as a progressive, or you can even go, I can hear people as a conservative, I believe, whatever. And that's just sort of leading with an ideological framework rather than, and, and it's, it's sort of a lens, I guess, of how they're interpreting data rather than trying to be, you know, I'm not saying I don't have a lens. I'm not going to be one of those people that like, I don't have any biases or preconceptions, but I do my damn best to like, if someone points it out to me, I'll try to be aware of it and, and get rid of it and try to just be as, as dispassionate as I possibly can about things. And especially on this issue of sort of sex and gender that I started talking about, I mean, all the incentive structures were there for me to just go in that direction and just sort of go with the way things were going, especially since I'm like a lifelong Democrat. I've always voted for uh, Democrats my entire life. I was 100% for gay marriage and uh, across the board. I mean, I just have all these progressive bona fides where, you know, all, but all of a sudden, because I disagree, I'm some far right, you know, alt right person. But that's just not who I was. Like all <laughs> the incentives were there for me just to sort of go along with this ideology because that would have sure made my life a whole lot easier <laughs> as a scientist. Um, but, you know, there was just, I guess, a, a fundamental thing that I had done when I had been in the atheist community and, you know, trying to be, apply skepticism and, um, to, to everything that I do is uh, just looking for the, the dynamics that are that are taking place in these movements. And I really saw a, like a lot of the similar types of arguments that I was familiar with, with young earth creationists and things like that being said by my, my own colleagues. We had, you know, there was a specific idea in intelligent design called irreducible complexity, like this, you know, the eyeball is so complex, it could not have possibly evolved by by random chance or in selection, you know, this has to be the guidance of some creator. You know, now it's not a perfect analogy, but you have people who are, you know, what I would call sex denialist people who are making arguments from complexity saying, oh, you know, biological sex is such a complex thing. Who even knows what a male and female really is? Can anybody really say maybe we should just let people self-identify into these categories? And, you know, they're not perfect examples. I mean, but uh, there, there is some overlap in the sort of types of arguments that's being made uh, where there's this sort of like they point out something and then there's a lot of hand waving and then it's just like, well, you know, what can we really say anyway about these things? And so I, th- I think I was sort of primed by my experience in this sort of skeptic atheist community to see a lot of these sort of religious based arguments and the parallels have just multiplied. I mean, I see it so much. <laughs> everywhere nowadays um yeah it's, it's been it's been a fascinating thing to observe i hope you've been enjoying this episode of you must be some kind of therapist podcast if you like what you're hearing now's a great time to like subscribe follow rate review or share you can also support the podcast by visiting sometherapist.com slash shop where you will find goods and services i have personally curated to support your well-being and enrich your life We're just building the shop, so check back periodically and feel free to suggest recommendations. All right, now back to the show. So I hear you describing, when when it comes to the narratives about sex and gender, this um, denial and obscuration of the facts that we do know, because those are questions that have been answered. What is a man? What is a woman? And I can imagine, I, I can hardly imagine as a scientist, when your career is about building on the information we already have and formulating new hypotheses to keep pushing the frontier forward of gathering more information that we don't know, the fact that people are 
pretending we don't know what we do already know, what we do already know is a foundation for continuing to explore. I mean, that might must be mind-bogglingly frustrating. Yeah. I mean, I just see it as it is so enormously wasteful of all these discoveries of all the scientists in the past who had work their butts off to find, you know, the, the chromosomal basis of sex determination and, you know, all the people who describe the development of male and female reproductive anatomy and, you know, Darwin's work on sex differences. And I mean, there's just so much that was done that took countless hours of so many scientists and so many geniuses to make these discoveries that we're just letting this completely erode behind us and pretending like, we don't know what we're talking about when we're talking about males and females. It, it hurts <laughs> it, to, to see that happen. It's just, I just see all this important knowledge. Like, I'm so glad that there the books exist and there's repositories of this because ultimately it's, it's going to be there unless there's, you know, some severe book burning or some electric storm that wipes out all our databases or something. But I mean, that's the, that those facts aren't going to go away. So they're at least rediscoverable and, Hopefully at some point we shake off this this weird uh, sort of anesthetic we all seem to be experiencing right now when we, when we start realizing that you know, these are actually true things. And, you know, we don't always have to try to, you know, overturn certain ideas. You know, it, it could be a symptom of this publisher perish and some people want to publish a new uh, idea. You know, oh, Darwin was wrong. Like you'll see these headlines every couple of years or something. And it's like, eh, no, he wasn't. <laughs> and then you just sort of have this sort of publication mill where you need to start saying new things. And the, the latest thing is, you know, sex is a spectrum, sex isn't binary. Uh, and they're just making these really novice level arguments that really shouldn't get any attention in the academy, except maybe of ridicule, but they've, they've sort of taken a lot of positions of power in the academy where these statements can just go by and no one, no one even raises an eyebrow or, or, they don't raise eyebrows because they're afraid of the, the social repercussions of doing so. Mm. So again, you're analyzing the social forces at play in what could be going on, why science is being undermined. And one of those being the publisher parish, like you say, in academia, um, that you, you have to stay fresh, you have to generate new content. And somehow this is the latest source of new ways of twisting things around. I don't know. I, I, I Here's where I want to go with this next, though. I mean, I have the pleasure of getting to interview an actual biologist on my podcast. So I will ask you, as a biologist, as a scientist, what is sex? And is it a binary or a spectrum? Yeah. yeah. So if we're talking about humans, I guess we, we, can, we can zoom back if we want to talk about it on a few different levels. You can say, what is sex is sort of a conceptual way you know not the act itself but what are the sexes you know what what is sexual reproduction um and this is basically the combining of genetic material from two different individuals to create a new unique individual now, there's all kinds of evolutionary reasons for this um you know you're creating a new unique individual that has its own uh you know that has genes from its it's both its parents so it's completely unique so if there were you know some disease to wipe that's going to go through a population you know, you have individuals that are more, that are unique enough where they're not, you know, some individuals are going to be spared. Rather, if you had like an asexual organism, they're all essentially clones. And so those lineages tend to die out because they get wiped out by, by pathogens or parasites and things like that. Um, so fundamentally, it's just the combining of genetic material to create a new unique organism for a next generation. Uh, Let me pause you there because, sorry, just, just to clarify, yeah. just to break down real simple. So. All organisms make new life and there's asexual reproduction and there's sexual reproduction, right? And so yeah. asexual reproduction, they're basically making more of the exact same genetic material. Whereas with sexual yeah. reproduction, it's like you said, uh, genetic material from two different organisms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and exactly. how long has sexual reproduction been around? You know, it's not entirely clear, but many... You know, uh, up to possibly billions of years, but I think some people put it at like 600 million. Um, it's it's kind of hard to, to determine exactly when uh, when that happened, but a very, very, very long time. You know, this is 
much longer than humans have existed on the planet, much you know longer than a lot of you know this these this, these things started way 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 back um, when a lot of body plans were just sort of getting uh, evolving into existence. So yeah, it's been around a long time back when you know there was mainly just algae <laughs> on the planet. Um, so so, just, so you have this. Oh, go ahead. Just to break down real simple though, so. For an organism to replicate, it can either, there's either one or two. There's asexual, making identical offspring, and there's sexual, making offspring with 50 50 genetic material. I'm not sure if I'm using the technical terms. Is, is, yeah, has there ever been an instance of new life being made with input from more than two sources of genetic material? It's actually a really interesting question. So you could have individuals, so there are some organisms, like some bacteria, and they'll incorporate sort of genetic material that's just sort of in their environment, and a lot of them will, like, they'll shed this genetic material too. So you could conceivably have organisms that are incorporating genetic material from, from their environment and putting it into their genome. But there aren't like any examples, I think, of organisms where like there's three individuals that are specifically coming together and you know, sort of this like triforce mating thing and then all separating. Um, it's it's generally just two organisms that are finding one another. And then that's there's a sliding scale between that as well. So you can have individuals that have, you know, um, if we want to talk about gametes, these are the sex cells, these are the parts of the organism that fuse to become a new individual later on. And you can uh, range from these sex cells being the same size to them being different sizes. And when you have a system where there's different sized sex cells, uh, this is where we have the existence of males and females. Like a male, sort of in a zoomed out capacity uh, perspective, a male is the individual that is contributing the small gamete, the small sex cell to this process of sexual reproduction. And the female is the individual that is producing the larger one or the, we might call an egg or an ova. Right. So just to clarify for anyone who's hearing this and thinking gonads, you're, when you say sex cells, you're not talking about the tissues that make up a penis or a vagina or a uterus. You're talking about a very, very, very tiny cell, yeah. which is you, you in humans, the sperm or the egg, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So yeah. in humans, it's sperm and egg. In many animals, it's sperm and egg. But also in different types of species, there are pairs of two kinds of gametes that are complementary that work together, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, it so it's always a small and, and a large. Yeah. So you have a, it's always a small and a large for systems that have males and females. And that's how you define a male and female at sort of a zoomed out level. So this is where a lot of the a lot of the confusion arrives because you'll have an activist or something come along and say, well, you know, what about adolescent boys? They don't create sperm. They haven't gone through puberty yet. Are they males? Or what about a postmenopausal woman or something like that? Like they're no longer, you know, producing eggs. Are they a woman? What if you're born and you're infertile? There's all these types of things. And so there's, as I mentioned, there's kind of two levels to look at. There's a conceptual level, like what are the males and females and on a very like conceptual evolutionary level, the males are the individuals that are creating the small gametes, the females produce the large ones. But when we're actually talking about sexing an individual organism, a flesh and blood individual, well, what are we talking about there? How do we decide which one is the male and the female? Um, you can just say like which one is creating the egg or the sperm. But fundamentally what we're looking at is whether or not their reproductive system, their primary sexual anatomy is organized around the production of either small or large gametes, whether or not it's functional or unfunctional, whether or not it can actually do it. So um, primarily this, this really comes down to whether or not you have uh, uh, testes or ovarian tissue. So that's sort of the fundamental split between how you identify what a, a male and female is. We use genitalia as a proxy when we're born because that is just almost as one-to-one -one correlating as you can have with the type of uh, gonad that you have. But again, it's not always 100% you know, determine, uh, deter determination. Um, and I, I still maintain the position that a lot of people don't actually, that 
there may be fa- uh, some individuals who may not be, you know, strictly being able to put into the male or female category. I mean, people can have uh, gonads that have a bit of ovarian and testicular tissue. Um, it could be that they have some components of both sexes to them, or maybe they could be considered undefined. They're sort of sexually ambiguous in some sense. But that doesn't mean that males and females aren't real. About 99.98% of individuals can be just put in unambiguously into these boxes of 100% male and 100% female. Um, and, and an ambiguous sexual phenotype isn't a third sex. It's just merely you know, neither or combination of both. Um, when we talk about sex being binary, a lot of people, a lot of activists will think that what we're saying is that every single individual who has ever lived can be put into the male or female box. Whereas that's not what I'm saying. When I say that sex is binary, I'm saying that there are only two sexes. And, you know, even if not everyone can possibly fit in those boxes. So think of like maybe a binary compound. It's composed of two things or like a binary star system. There's two, there's two there. An ambiguously sex individual isn't an additional sex. It's just, it, it's not outside of, uh, you know, male and female, uh, really. So that's, I hope that sort of is clarifying to some degree. Yeah. So I've gotten to talk with some people who have disorders of sexual development. So chromosomal, chromosomal abnormal, chromosomal abnormalities. Um, so you mentioned earlier Kleinfelter's syndrome, there's Turner syndrome, and there's several others. So as you described, there might be XXY or something uh, unusual when it comes to the chromosomes. It's my understanding from talking to these people that, like you're saying, there are still only two sexes and that no matter what the chromosomal difference, um, each person's body, even if they have a little bit of this kind of tissue and a little bit of that kind of tissue, is still only designed to produce one gamete. So there's never been a, a body in existence, as I understand it, that has produced both small and large gametes. Does that sound correct? Yeah. So there is like one paper that is like in a, a person who was by all accounts biologically male, who they did find like some ovarian tissue in one of his testes had it. And there's like evidence that there was, could have been like an ovulatory event in the testicular tissue, in the ovarian tissue that was in uh, in their scrotum. Uh, but this person was was fertile as a male. They were completely infertile. They didn't have the infrastructure apart from just like, you know, a little part of their ovarian tissue actually created a, a novum at one point. Uh, but they, they didn't have the supporting structures to be, uh, you know, fertile as a female. So no individual has ever been, you know, capable of both being a father and giving birth at the same time. Right. Um, they haven't been fertile with both. Yeah. And even if they could, even if we found that individual, you know, there would still be two sexes. It's just that this individual would be composed of both. You know, they wouldn't be some third sex. You know, a hermaphrodite isn't something other than male or female. It's both male and female. So there's still like that binary of there's two components, um, whereas in some organisms they can find themselves, you know, resting in, inside a single organism, um, whereas mostly I've- they're they're not. I've also gathered from talking with the people that I have talked with, which, you know, is only a handful of individuals, but um, people who have DSDs, disorders of sexual development, that um, they really don't appreciate having their medical condition roped into someone else's political agenda. Because I think a lot of the people in the trans rights movement, first of all, they they overrepresent the percentage of the population that could be considered intersex or DSD. And then they kind of use that, like you're saying, as, as proof that, that their ideology is correct, that there are more than two sexes. And, um, or the sex what is I've, expected. Yeah. yeah. And what I've heard from the people I've talked with is, Hey, we have a, a disorder that's difficult to manage. It's painful, it's expensive, it's disabling in some ways. And uh, sex is still a binary. We don't appreciate you using our medical condition in service of promoting your ideas. And I've heard from 
people who have had to deal with hormonal issues, like, um, for example, a man whose body couldn't naturally produce testosterone, who had to be put through an artificially induced puberty, that, you know, he would not wish upon anyone to have to go through some variation of that because their their own personal experience of needing medical interventions uh, has been really, really difficult. Yeah. And I'll also point out that the the dragging of intersex people into the debate about transgenderism, is this a complete non sequitur as well? I mean, I've encountered this when I talk about, you know, should males compete in female sports? And I'll talk about how well, males and females are these distinct biological entities. Some activists will say, well, you know, sex is a spectrum because here's an intersex person. Um, therefore, you should allow anyone to identify into these categories because they're blurry categories or something where we're talking, we're not, we're not talking about intersex athletes. That's a whole other debate we can have. We can talk about whether someone like Castro Semenya should be able to compete in the female category. Um, and people can have reasonable disagreements on this issue. I think, um, where to draw the line at DSDs. Um, can you have any testicular tissue, you know, how much of, you know, what, how much of your reproductive anatomy needs to be this way? Uh, you know, there, there's all kinds of interesting arguments, and that's a fascinating one to have. Um, but what we're fundamentally talking about in the, the trans issue with, in sports aren't intersex athletes. We're talking about people who are unambiguously male or unambiguously, you know, they're trying to play in sports designed for people who are, you know, unambiguously female. So, like, they're not intersex themselves. So them dragging intersex people into this whole thing as an argument for letting them compete, it, it just does not follow at all. It's a complete non sequitur. So here's another practical question to clear things up. Can humans change sex? No. <laughs> uh, I would say that pretty confidently. I mean even though there are some species out there like clownfish that can change their sex, um, there's been no evidence that humans can do that. You know, we can uh, modify our, our genitalia and we can sort of have plastic surgeries to, to make us appear as the other sex. But fundamentally, you know, we've, we've gone through a certain amount of development through our lives that have you know, created us into males or females. And, that's something that can't really be re reversed, at least not fully. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's just what I would what I would say. People would would you know question whether or not it can be fully reversed enough in order to justify sort of a male competing as a female, or you know maybe in a world where we have transplants or something where you can actually put a uterus into a male body. You know, maybe there can be an asterisk because I would say you know that's they're kind of female in a way. <laughs> if they can do this, but there's still an asterisk for all sorts of contexts like sports and things like, uh, because their bodies had gone through a certain type of development before. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I would say that, you know, I've never seen an example of anyone being able to literally change their sex. That's not merely cosmetic. Right. So if, if someone tries to change their sex, what they're doing is either, as you're saying, having plastic surgeries, which alter, the visible or secondary sex characteristics of how the body is shaped. Um, so that's more of an appearance and structure thing. Um, and they can alter their hormones, and we can talk about that. Um, but neither of those interventions affects either what type of gametes your body is designed around producing, as you are saying, whether it functionally does that or not, um, and, and your chromosomes which as you were saying, for 99.98% .98 of people who don't have DSDs are going to be either XX or XY, right? Yeah. I think a lot of this debate about, you know, how much of your body can you modify in order to be considered the opposite sex, um, there's a confusion between primary sexual anatomy, which is going to be your, your, uh, your gonads, whether or not you have ovarian or testicular tissue, and your secondary sex characteristics, which are things like, um, you know, facial hair that you grow when you go through puberty, you know, the development of breasts, your body, overall body shape, your, you know, widening of the hips and the way fat is distributed over your body. 
how big your hands are, if you have upper body strength gets developed when you go through male puberty. You know, these are all sort of things that we maybe every day associate with being male and female. But at a really fundamental level, these have absolutely nothing to do with your sex per se. These are consequences of your sex. These aren't defining of your sex. Um, I've made an analogy before. Um, You know, we can talk about two different groups of people, bikers or cyclists, okay? Uh, If you're a biker, you ride a motorcycle, okay? That is like the fundamental thing that makes you a biker. If you're a cyclist, you ride a bicycle. You know, there's a pretty fundamental difference between a bicycle and a motorcycle. You know, one has a, an engine that propels you, one is propelled by your, your feet. Uh, but there's also secondary characteristics associated with being a biker or being a, uh, being a cyclist. You know, if you're a biker, you might wear like leathers. You might wear this big helmet that's over your head. You're going to, and these are for reasons of you're, you're going much more quickly when you're riding a bicycle. You need more protection. You need more uh, you know, this sort of body armor type thing. Maybe there's even social things and maybe you have tattoos, maybe you wear bandanas, maybe you're more likely to smoke cigarettes, whatever. These are like secondary things that you might associate with being a biker. Uh, but then when you talk about cyclists, you know, maybe they're more likely to wear spandex, lighter stuff, more breathable things, you know, uh, helmets that sit on the top that are lightweight because they they need to have a, more like a lighter system because they're propelling themselves with their own muscles. But fundamentally, none of those secondary traits to define them being a biker or a cyclist. You could have a person riding a motorcycle who's wearing spandex, uh, and they would be just as much of a biker as one who's got a bunch of tattoos and a leather, uh, you know, leathers on. Um, Because the fundamental difference between a biker and a cyclist is whether they're riding a bicycle or whether they're riding a motorcycle. And similar to sex, you can have... You know, if I got breast implants tomorrow, like that's not going to change whether or not I'm a female. I'm not going to become more of a female. I could start taking cross-sex hormones and sort of appear my fat deposits are going to change, um, you know, more around my hips or things like that. But still, that doesn't do anything whatsoever to change my sex. Um, sort of just like wearing leathers or spandex or the types of helmets you wear. These are the secondary characteristics of, of, of sex. Uh, whereas the primary ones are what type of gonad you have. That's similar to whether or not you're riding a bicycle or driving a motorcycle. That is one way that I try to tease apart this difference between primary and secondary sex characteristics and why changing these secondary ones don't actually determine whether or not uh, you're a male or female or, in my analogy, a, a biker or a cyclist. So I hope that's somewhat illuminating to people in the in the in who, who are watching and listening. And to make the metaphor more exact, I would add that in your analogy, everyone has one type of vehicle and it's either a motorcycle or a bicycle. And a person might kind of cosplay, they might play around with what clothing they're putting on their body or even who they're hanging around with. If you're hanging, if you're a cyclist hanging around with bikers, for instance, um, but you either have a motorcycle or you have a bicycle. And yeah. also to add and to the analogy, yeah. if you if you wear the gear that's associated with the other one, um, there might be some side effects to that. Like, for example, if you go out on a motorcycle wearing only a bicyclist's outfit, then you might not have the, the way the leather jacket protects your body from the wind speed. Um, yeah. Or there could be social consequences. You'd probably be ridiculed if you show up to a biker gang and you're wearing spandex clothing. And there's there's all these analogies you can use to for you know for the sex differences too. Like if you're presenting as a very feminine appearing male, like you you might receive social abuse for doing that. If you're a very masculine female, you're presenting um, you know very wearing masculine clothes, or you know you might be experience harassment uh, for those reasons. But that doesn't mean that you're more male or you know, less female or something. And also, if even if you had a, a, a sort of a, a bicycle that had an engine on it where you have both pedals and that, it still wouldn't mean that there's no such thing as bicycles and motorcycles. Like, they're, they still exist. They're still real things that are definite, these, like, clear differences between those. Just because you might have something with, a, with a, an engine and pedals doesn't really neglect the fact that they're still... Uh, you know, there's real differences between these two categories. 
So getting practical for a moment, why does this conversation matter? Why does sex matter? Why does it matter that, that sex is a binary and that we should know that and talk about it as such? Is there any harm in people having their whatever beliefs they might want to have, even if it's not what science would say? So I think there's definitely context where sex doesn't matter, or at least it shouldn't matter. If we're going to decide whether somebody should get a raise or someone should get a job, that certainly shouldn't matter. I would hope that we shouldn't be you know, asking people what their sex is before we decide uh, whether to give them, give them a raise or anything like that. Um, so there's plenty of context where this type of discrimination would just be completely morally wrong. Uh, when I was recently, I, I attended like the Leah Thomas uh, event at, at Georgia Tech, and some of the counter protesters uh, were holding up a sign that said, you know, no discrimination ever is okay or something along those lines. And I just think there's a fundamental mistake there because discrimination is just our ability to discern between two different things. You know, we can, I can discriminate between certain colors or something like that. Um, and it's not discrimination per se that makes something immoral. It really is all about the context. Like most people would agree that I shouldn't be able to compete in sports against children. But to prevent me from doing that would, would require age discrimination. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a grown man. I have no place playing with them. And most people would think it's morally good to have, keep me from playing in the, my children's little league team or something like that. Um, but that's that's still discrimination. But it's one that we all agree is towards a more... Uh, you know, justifiable goal. Um, And I think there are certain contexts where sex does matter. Most probably contexts probably it doesn't or shouldn't matter. Um, But when we're talking about sports, for instance, it's usually a pretty clear one because of the sex differences and athletic performance between males and females that specifically due to the fact that males go through male puberty and that they just, testosterone has this effect on you know, a system-wide effect on our bodies that make us bigger, faster, stronger. And there's even sex differences before puberty as well uh, that, that that are there. So it's not purely the result of going through male puberty, but there's, there's you know, other genetic factors as well. So, um, yeah, so sports are a big one. There's also the fact of, you know, differences in, in male aggression, instances of rape or things like that, wanting to have, you know, women have their own spaces like bathrooms or, you know, their own rape shelters or things like that, where they can go to right to be in their own prisons where they don't have to worry about, uh, you know, male violence that, that a lot of, uh, women have to worry about, um, unfortunately. So there's this all kinds of context. Some are more clear cut, like sports and prisons. I think some are less so like, I mean, I'm People disagree. I think bathrooms is one of those issues where I, I, I think they should be sex segregated, but um, it's maybe less important than sports and prisons, for example. And yeah, there's a lot of social factors that I think that go into where you can say that females should be able to have the right to have their own spaces that are free of, of male bodies um, for, for whatever reason. And that identity doesn't really do anything to change your your biology and it's not the factor that that really matters um in deciding who has access to certain spaces uh because if you base things on identity identity i mean there's basically that just means there's no rules because anyone can just identify from one thing moment to moment um it's, it's essentially just having having no no protected space whatsoever once you just open it up to people's subjective experience of what they think manhood and womanhood is mm-hmm so that's my and, spiel. Mm-hmm. And can you tell us a little bit about the impact of taking cross-sex hormones, so the impact of testosterone on the female body and vice versa? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can't describe it from a – well, I guess I did go through male puberty, but I can't really compare first person to how it felt you know, to go through female puberty. But what's interesting to read – is the accounts of people who are males who start taking cross-sex hormones and uh, females who start taking male cross-sex hormones. Um, at least in the accounts that I've read, <laughs> there's, uh, at least on, an, uh, on a personality and the way that they, they feel, a lot of trans men who are beginning to take testosterone, they really describe what it feels like to be sort of a teenage boy going through it. They talk about 
they have higher levels of aggression. They get in, incredibly horny. <laughs> That's the constant thing that tends to come out. Um, you know, they, they will, if you're a trans man, if you're a female taking testosterone, your voice will become lowered. Uh, that's actually irreversible. So it's if you stop taking testosterone or start taking estrogen again or something, your voice will remain permanently lowered. Uh, you won't get any taller, but your bone structure will change quite a bit. You'll get more of the square jaw. Um, you'll start getting more, you know, upper arm strength, that type of thing. Uh, your fat distribution, you know, you'll find that you're going to probably lose weight faster. You're going to um, not hold on to fat as, as much. And it's going to be distributed differently. Whereas if you take, if you're male and you're taking to, uh, estrogen, uh, you tend to, to gain weight. They tend to, you know, it sounds stereotypical. They tend to become, they, they report crying a lot more. They report being very emotional. Uh, you know, this could be, this is new taking this drug as well. But I mean, there are stereotypes and, you know, they're there for some reason. It's not, there's not that they're, this is the way everyone experiences these things, but um, it's not completely baseless. So you do sort of see people kind of go through uh, cross-sex puberty in, in, a, in a very real way. And it's, it's really fascinating because this is, uh, does mediate a lot of social interactions. And uh, this is a, an evolved trait. And it does show how much of one's body is actually not purely genetic, but it's due to sort of just the, the hormone levels we have coursing through our bodies. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Do you know much about the long-term impacts of those hormones in terms of um, the elevated disease risk of taking cross-sex hormones for several years? I'm not too well-versed in that. Um, I know that there are increased risks of um, sort of uh, heart-related issues by taking testosterone. Uh, I'm not sure if it's higher than it is just for males generally if you're uh, if you're a trans man, um, but generally men sort of have... Uh, more heart problems than females do. And so they do see elevated risk. I know that taking uh, estrogen, you have a higher risk of, of blood clots. Um, I'm not sure, again, if that's higher risk than the average female, or even if there is a main sex difference in the uh, probability that you'll develop blood clots. Um, but there are, you know, certain side effects that you need to be aware of. I know specifically for if you're taking testosterone and you're female, uh, your body will kind of start to degrade your uterus. And you will, I think, after a few years of taking testosterone, they recommend having a full hysterectomy just because it'll start kind of shedding off by itself and you don't want to sort of go septic by having, um, you know, something that's that's degrading inside your body. So that's something that people definitely need to be aware of when they're uh, when they're taking these, which shockingly sometimes is not being made aware to a lot of people. Um, a lot of females who go, who go through this types of therapy. So, I've heard that the vaginal atrophy is really painful. I can't even I can barely imagine. I'm sure people have bad like period cramps. I can imagine that this is on a whole other level. I think we need to talk about this because people are not giving fully informed consent to what they're putting in their bodies, and yeah. I also think it's relevant, just more theoretically speaking, in the dialogue about you know, can we change sex because. I think there's a difference going into taking cross-sex hormones if you believe that you will change sex. Um, but understanding that that you biologically cannot change sex, so you're not going to change your gametes or your chromosomes, um, we still need to think of it no matter what your ideology as what is the impact of testosterone on the female body and what is the impact of the estrogen on the male body when the the doses of these hormones that people are putting into their bodies is something that is unprecedented in evolutionary history, as I understand it, until now. Yeah, there's actually an interesting point you brought up, too, is, is the ideological component that we see now with the people who are taking these cross-sex hormones, because they're, they're quite literally being told that they can change their sex, that, you know, that sex is merely their secondary sex traits, and if they just change enough of them, well, then you know, statistically, there will be male or there'll be female or whatever. Um, whereas if you look at some of the older generations of people who call themselves sort of transsexuals rather than the whole new transgender uh, label, people like Buck Angel, for instance, uh, there's no ideology involved with them. If anything, they're more uh, intuitively aware of their own biology and uh, what they went through than, than any of the people who are going through this right now. Because, you know, Buck 
knows that they're biologically female. They'll have no problem saying that out loud. Uh, and they've merely taken testosterone because they feel more comfortable, um, you know, living you know, as a man socially, uh, being perceived that way, even if they know that that's not literally what they are. Uh, that is a, sort of a fundamental difference because you see a lot of the newer generation, the people who are sort of coming to this transgenderism that's kind of rooted in this ideology of queer theory, but they're being told they're being told lies about what they can do with their bodies, and you know even that if they don't do anything with their bodies, if they merely identify some way, then that makes them what they want to be. Um, and so, a lot of what I'm trying to do is really just address this <laughs> this issue and show that um, you know gender ideology is an ideology. This is not merely akin to sort of you know maybe the gay rights movement where all that was asked of people was to you know, expand their notion of what it means to love somebody. And, and I know that you accept the fact that you can fall in love with someone of the same sex and that it is just as meaningful as opposite sex attraction. And it was, you know, you, there was no ideology involved there. It was, it was just letting other people enter into this thing that we, we already sort of have for, for other people. Um, and I think this is going to be a limitation, a big limitation of the current gender movement, because, a lot of people are becoming more and more aware <laughs> that they're being asked to, uh, I guess, agree and to go along with an ideology that is really just it's at odds with with reality in a very fundamental way. And so um, a lot of people are, are starting to say no. And so that's it's very promising. And there is such a big misconception there. I'm glad you brought it up, right? The the misconception being that what's happening right now with the trans rights movement is just kind of another iteration of the gay rights movement. And that if you were in support of gay rights, gay marriage in the past, then the next thing to do is be in support of trans rights. And it is very different for a couple of reasons. One of the most important reasons, practically speaking, being what you and I just discussed about the fact that um, since you cannot change sex, um, any of these hormonal or medical interventions um, are fundamentally testosterone in a female body or estrogen in a male body or the removing of healthy um, tissues. And so one big difference that I see in that it is vastly preferable from a health perspective to be comfortable with your birth sex and not feel the need to alter it. Whereas from a health perspective, there's no reason why it's a disadvantage to be gay. There's no disadvantage to being gay unless you're dealing with homophobia and that's more of a social issue. So that's a distinction I like yeah. to make. And the same with all the stuff about, you know, conversion therapy bills, including gender identity and these things, or schools making policies where they're not being required to tell parents if their kid is using a, a completely different opposite sex name or using new pronouns these are all being modeled after the very successful and I think just gay rights movement. Like, I don't think there is really a reason if your son or daughter is, you know, hanging out and expressing, you know, the attraction to the, the same sex, like that is, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no harm. Um, and there's fundamentally nothing wrong with someone identifying as the opposite sex. Um, but it is, it is a medical condition. This is gender dysphoria and this often leads to irreversible hormone therapies and even surgeries. And so this is something I think that's fundamentally different than whether or not your kid is just expressing the same sex attraction. This is a very serious medical condition that needs to be, I think, known uh, by, by parents. Um, yeah. So it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of differences and I think they've gotten as far as they have now by writing on sort of the coattails and the cultural and momentum that the gay rights movement had. Um, but people are becoming more and more aware that there is a fundamental difference here and that, um, you know, this is it's not really tenable. This is what I observed when I was at the Leah Thomas competition. It's how many people left that event and giving us thumbs ups and we're, uh, you know, the, they know, they know the difference between a male and a female. Um, and th they know that they're being asked to agree with something that's just fundamentally not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when, take home there is that gender dysphoria is a medical condition that does not require the medical interventions that we're currently seeing, which are dangerous and come with a lot of complications. Gender dysphoria can be treated as a mental health condition, and that is vastly preferable from a medical standpoint to not have to put your body 
through those interventions and their consequences. And this is why we need to reverse uh, the redefinition of conversion therapy to allow therapists to question gender identity and treat it as a psychological and social phenomenon rather than as something that requires hormones and surgeries. So thank you for helping me lay all of that out so clearly. I am uh, I wish that we'd gotten around to talking about your work at the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. I was really curious to hear about that. Maybe you can come back some other time and tell us about it. I'm happy to come back whenever you want me to. This was awesome. Thank you so much, Colin. It's been great talking with you. All right, until next time. I hope you enjoyed this episode of You Must Be Some Kind of Therapist podcast with Stephanie Wynn, LMFT. This podcast is produced by Eric and Amber Beals at Different Mix. Special thanks to the talented musician Joey Pecorero for our theme song, Half Awake. At SomeTherapist.com, you can find more information on any topic, guest, resource, product, or service you've heard of here today. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram at SomeTherapist. If you would like to ask a question, suggest a topic, be a guest, or invite me to speak, you can email us at hello at SomeTherapist.com. You can also send us a voice memo with your question, and we just might play it. Of course, just because I'm some therapist doesn't mean I'm your therapist. This podcast is not a substitute for medical advice. If you need help, ask your doctor or browse your local therapists online. And whatever you do next, please take care of yourself. Eat well, sleep well, move your body, get outside, and tell someone you love them. You're worth it.